I guess the way I wanted to kind of start the interview uh, was we could just kind of talk up, talk about the the making of the record. And, and what I'd like to do is maybe talk about the lead up to the writing process for clearing to clearing the path to ascend. And, you know, where the band was at coming off the Atma record. And am I saying that right? Is that how you guys say Atma? Okay, yeah, where, where the band was coming up off the Atma record. Well, um, we'd, uh, it was kind of an interesting chunk of time. I mean, when we first got back together with, and, and Aaron came on board, um, we hadn't really anticipated that the band had kind of grown in the time that we'd been away. And so when we released The Great Cessation, that started a string of touring and traveling like we'd never done before. And that whole process carried right into uh, Atma or Atma, Atma. Um, and uh, and we'd done probably, I don't know, maybe close to 150 shows or something touring that record. And, and at the time I, I had a job where they'd given me time to tour because a, a number of different opportunities had come our way, including the first uh, tool tour. Mm -hmm. And it was in 2012 and uh, well, Actually, previously it was first it was Roadburn, and then came back, and then went on tour. And I took a, a sabbatical from work, so we were gone for about. We did the 150 shows probably over like six months or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then wow. I came back to work, and then that's when the tool tour happened. And then I had to quit work because I'm like, okay, well I'm not gonna ask for more time off, yeah. and so. I quit and uh, started doing the band full time. And we, we played a lot. And I think leading up to, you know, all of that leading up to clearing the path to ascend. I mean, I haven't made it uh, a mystery that, you know, I've had pretty serious st struggles with depression um, and uh, anxiety in the past. and since this time I've really come a, a very long way and uh, I've done a lot of work and um, gathered some good tools and uh, can happily say I'm a lot farther along the path on that in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, really clear in the path to ascend was like, a, it was, it was, I don't, know, I don't want to overstate anything. I, I think it was kind of, you know, it felt like a defiant act to me mm -hmm. against the the whirlpool I felt like I was stuck in. And, uh, and so that record, like many of them, is this combination of like something like mysticism and, but also feet in the mud trying to slug it through mm -hmm. and uh with the goal really being to get to a better place get to a realization get to an understanding that is stable you know that it becomes something that can be anchored and uh and so that was the goal for me in retrospect i mean at the, at the time i was just yeah you know using the music as medicine mm -hmm. And uh, um, we were writing the record right up until we hit the studio. It was this furious going for it. And Marrow was the last thing to be finished. And uh, really some of the most kind of integral parts of that song came together like a week before the studio or two weeks, you know, if, if that. Um, and so um, that process was very much just on fire and we walked in the studio on fire and for ourselves and you know and we laid it down awesome and you were mentioning that uh you had kind of a, a break at the time or yab had broken up for a period of time or 
is that how you're categorizing it? Uh, was there a feeling of like still renewed energy going into this record with the band? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it was, we're in uncharted territory. Not that anybody knows how long their band's going to be around or whatever it is, but we'd certainly never anticipated to start again. And then to all of a sudden have this new life uh, as a band and, uh, and where not only was our, the current music we were working on feeling really inspired and we were happy, but our older music was becoming better with us. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were becoming a better band in general. And, and those older records were being discovered by a new audience, mm -hmm. uh, certainly new to us anyway. And that wasn't anything unique to our band. I think that there was a lot of music in the underground, stoner, doom, whatever you want to call it, that was getting on uh, the radar of a lot more people, uh, journalists and you know enthusiasts. So we were benefiting from that as well. And, but yeah, we were we were we were fired up. That's awesome. Um... I'd like to dive in a little bit about the, the, the making of the record itself and, and kind of talk a little bit about the recording process, if you can recall it. Um, so maybe can you tell us a little bit about the making of Clearing the Path to Ascend? We recorded at Gung Ho, with, uh, which is in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, Billy Barnett is the engineer there. And he's been recording bands since... 1970 mm -hmm. and he has his his own studio that's analog digital um very very nice room lots of amazing gear his main gig is recording uh symphony orchestras mm. and and so he'll like there's a a hall here called uh the holt center and they have lots of uh classical shows throughout the year and he's the guy who records it all he records every every offering that they do throughout the year so but he's also recorded a lot of punk and metal and, folk and rock and he's recorded donovan and he's recorded cherry mm -hmm. pop and daddy so he's recorded you know all these different bands and we started he We'd done everything at Dogwood. And when we started having Billy do the mixing process, from there on, there wasn't a record that he didn't have his hands on in some way. So uh, he mixed and mastered both The Illusion of Motion and The Unreal Never Lived. He mastered The Great Cessation. He mastered uh, Atma. And then this was the first time that we were able to go into his studio and track. And, and that was really exciting because you know, he was always, always felt like, he always did just amazing things with our record. And he would say things like, man, I wish I had a chance to record this particular thing, you know, in the mixing mm -hmm. process, I would have done this and this with it. And, and uh, so now we have opportunity to do that with him. So, even though it was the first time that he had actually tracked us, we've been working together for 10 years. Yeah. And so there's, it was really, and he, he gets it. Like he, he wants it to push hard. He wants the dynamics to be there. He wants quiet to be quiet, and loud to be loud, but have everything sit in its pocket in its place. But at the same time, feel like it's pushing and, uh, He's not afraid of the song lengths, you know, partly because of all the stuff he does, you know, with the symphonic music. He's not mm. afraid of mm. that stuff. And so we didn't have to explain to him in any way what we're doing, why we're doing it, what the tempos are and the different vocal styles. He knew it already. So we were poised to be in just a really good spot to just make a record. And without any, yeah, no, no misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. And... From there, we did it all uh, to two inch. Uh, he's got a two inch machine there. And we uh, did the, the rhythm tracks all live. 
and then uh, then did all the layering from there. And once we layered all the rhythm tracks and and uh, drums and bass, then we did switch it over into Pro Tools, mm -hmm. which it's you know it's good for editing. We don't we try not to we do editing, but we we try not to. We want to be careful with that, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it can be really, uh, it can be a temptation to want to fix every little thing and watch your record get smaller and smaller as it lines up perfectly. Yeah. And a certain amount of chorusing with things kind of being slightly off kilter makes it more lumbering, bigger, more of a beast, and uh, and real. You know, it feels more real. Uh, and all of our favorite records were more or less done that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we put a focus on really trying to be the best band we could be, and then record the band. And uh, but for recording vocals, digital is just—I mean, I've done a lot analog, and that's fine. But mm -hmm. being able to just do a take and 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 do a take again, another track, again, another track. That's you can't beat it, and and not having to mix a twenty minute song analog too. <laughs> yeah, because that's yeah. a you gotta that's do a performance. That. You got to do that in real time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. When we uh, mixed the song uh, Catharsis, uh, it took us eleven tries. <laughs> really, something like, something like that, and it was just one one thing that didn't mute or didn't yeah. unmute or whatever it is, just one little thing, tail end song, whatever. So rewind the tape, reset all the, the faders, yeah. start at zero, brew another pot of coffee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah even lose, down to- Lose even, a year of your life. <laughs> yeah, even down to the like, kind of like fading out the song too, you gotta kinda, you gotta do that on tape, right? Now I gotta nail that. Yeah. So, so it's, so that's that process, and um, uh, the the overall feeling in the studio was just that we were getting things the way we wanted, and uh, and that between us and Billy, we all sat together and we're really just sweating bullets to make it the best thing that it could be and lots of ideas being tossed around and lots of experiments. And, and uh, we were rehearsed enough to where it wasn't a matter of getting a take. So there's that opportunity to really be rehearsed. And I mean, the opportunity to experiment and explore and, and uh, really fun, actually. Cool. And when you guys got into the studio for this record, did you come in with fully baked ideas and, and songs or did you kind of you know, play around in the studio a little bit with it? Mostly baked. Um, usually the, the thing that is, that'll need the most tweaking will be vocals. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, I mean, we demo stuff on our own to a certain degree, but we focus a lot on music, a lot, a lot. And then it's not the vocals are an afterthought, but it's rather that, we're throwing ideas at it in the process. And Billy Barnett is just a very, he has a very sharp ear on, on many things, but one of the things he's really good at is vocals. And mm -hmm. he's a mu musician himself, he plays, been playing bands forever. Uh, he has a real keen ear for tension and release within vocal phrasing and pitch. Mm -hmm. And so he'd say like, what are you trying to do there? Like, I'd be trying to go for a certain thing. He's like, what is, what are you trying to do? And we'd pull out a keyboard and we'd be like, okay, what's the notes here we're trying to do? Okay, it's this, mm -hmm. this is what you're trying to do. And then I would hear it. Mm -hmm. The thing that I was attempting to do, then he heard what I was hoping to do said oh it's this note and i hear it and then go in and and do it and so i would say that there's some some things along there and then there's just a lot of experimenting in general like you know like every band goes through you know figuring out your tones mm -hmm. there's there's the tone that sounds good by itself but then there's not, it doesn't necessarily sound good in the mix and so going through the process of 
of figuring those things out and mic placement and what amp for, for what part and what pedal for what part. Yeah, fun. Yeah. But yeah, but I guess that was a long winded way of saying we worked probably vocals were the thing that we had to address the most as far as like mostly baked but needing more cook time. Yeah. But I implicitly trust Billy. So like when we're working on vocals and I'm going at a passage, when he says, Oh, okay, let's listen to that, like I wait for him to say that. Uh, John Cobbett, for that matter, when I've recorded with him for Vol, it's very similar. Like Cobbett has an immaculate ear and for pitch and vocal and vocal harmonies. And it's the same thing where I just really rely on people perform and they can tell me these people I trust. Oh, that was, let's, okay, you can redo it again if you want, but we're keeping that. And then we'll go over it and and uh, generally they're right. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, Mike, do you, can you hang on one second? I'm going to change my internet connection just because I'm having some network issues. Give me one sec. I noticed. Right, thank you. Yeah. You with me? Yeah. All right, cool. This is a, a little bit closer to the office here. So let's see if uh, this is better. Um, all right, well, cool. Thank you for that. And uh, I was curious also, um, what were you listening to leading up to this record? What were sort of some of the influential, some, what was some of the influential music you were listening to? Going into Clearing the Path of Sand. Um... Got the year right? Is it 2011, 2013? Uh, yeah, it came out in 14. So it was, I guess, end of 2013, we were recording. Um, yeah. In, into 2014, I, I, if I remember right. Well, I had been listening to this mix of, uh, you know, Joni Mitchell. Uh, I really love the Court and Spark record, mm. and uh, I was also listening to a fair amount of The Cure, mm -hmm. and particularly the the song "Underneath the Stars," which the name of the record it's one of their later records, and the mm -hmm. name of it's escaping me right now. But that song is it's just pure magic. Um, Listen to quite a bit of uh, you know Burning Witch and cathedral and mm -hmm. neurosis christian and immolation um, particularly the first two christian records uh, black force domain and apocalyptic revelation um, the uh i think about you know towns van zandt for sure mm -hmm. Daniel Higgs. Um, yeah, I mean, it's probably, you know, it's kind of hard to remember back to that time, but yeah. I, you know, I, I definitely remember all of that leading into it. And, yeah, it's uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of nailed a lot of it. I was I was interested in the Joni Mitchell stuff. Is that just as a guitar player with her alternate tunings that you're uh, uh, interested in her stuff? I, I like her the way she does her, her guitar tunings personally. Yeah. Yeah. The, her that and just the effortlessness that she appears to have with her her singing. Mm -hmm. Like you'll hear certain singers and and it doesn't necessarily and it can be a scream or a death roar too, but they're somehow there are some singers that when they're singing, it seems like there's no ceiling. Like yeah. there's just no no end to how far it goes. Like it, it might as well be beaming across galaxies. It's just mm -hmm. so it just opens up the sky when you hear hear a certain voice or a certain you know movement. And and she 
has that, but it's so just clean and pure mm -hmm. um, how she sings and and uh, um, and so I really like that. And so leading into like a song like Marrow, you know, we're trying to have a vocal that you have all this kind of crushing this happening around a vocal and I just wanted that vocal to sit in this really clean clear spot mm -hmm. and so I think the the Joni Mitchell might have been a, a bit of an inspiration in that direction yeah cool you were talking about uh just now just sort of um your vocals sitting on the spot and when I saw you guys in uh Los Angeles uh for the decibel festival i was i was telling aaron actually i think that the that room was perfect for you guys because of the just the vastness and the spacing of each each of you guys it was just it just created um it filled the room better than a lot of other bands did in that particular uh show and um i i was curious um what kind of touring opportunities came up after this album came out? You mentioned oh, the lead up to uh, the touring that you were doing going into this record. How about coming out of this record? Did you guys feel like you took another step? Well, you know, interesting uh, thing. While we were in the studio recording Clearing the Path to Ascend, uh, um, Tool had offered us another run with them. Mm. And we're like, we can't do it um, unless we could do like this string of shows that were in the Northwest. And they said, yes. So mm. uh, we broke out of the studio and probably like two and a half weeks into being in the studio, we broke out and did Spokane, Portland and Eugene. And then I think the Eugene show was on a Friday or Saturday. And we were back in the studio on Monday and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I would say after clearing the path to ascend, a lot of things opened up for us. We started doing, um, uh, more touring than we'd ever done. Mm -hmm. Um, and things increasingly being put forward that just was like, well, we can't say no to this. Well, we can't say no to this. Well, we can't say no to this. And and so there was a lot of things like that and uh um and then getting to the point where we have to say no to this because mm -hmm. <laughs> we're gonna you know we're gonna grind ourselves into the dirt here and try to take care of the try to take care of the baby you know yeah 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 for sure um i'm gonna be playing probably most of this record um and i think it's just because there's uh four songs on it I, i'd like to talk a little bit about each of the songs if you don't mind um and maybe something that stood out to you in the writing process or the recording process um and uh that what i'll end up doing is is kind of putting this in front of the songs as i play them um and i don't know maybe we could start with the the lead off track in our blood anything come to mind about that song and, and and well when we first were writing that song i don't know i'm sure it's different for everybody who's working out riffs and songs but uh i usually get some kind of manic idea about what the next record's going to be and what this song is going to be about and how it's going to hit and you know, this is going to be more of a crushing faster or this is going to be whatever and so in our blood started out being a much faster song mm -hmm. uh, almost like uh um like quantum mystic or something like that it was way more like gallopy and quicker and it was like cool but didn't something wasn't quite right about it and then i remember this moment of just kind of like all right let me try it slow mm -hmm. and then that was it we we slowed it down drastically from where we had it and mm. uh and then all of a sudden it worked and it was that song and so we made that decision i don't know maybe two or three months before hitting the studio so it still felt kind of fresh 
and uh, and then to lay it down that way and to hear it back um, the way like it was new, going to be. Just a new yeah. song to you, right? Yeah, it really just was like, wow, yeah, that was that was the right call. And just a kind of a continual reminder that I need to listen to what the music's telling me, mm -hmm. you know, and and there's this weird part of writing music where where it's this give and take of exerting your will but then also listening and feeling what's coming out and and it becomes in a weird way like an exchange of ideas between this budding idea that all of a sudden can take on a life of its own mm -hmm. and I, it sounds kind of woo woo, but that's the only way I can describe it from how it feels to me. Yeah. And uh, and I'm reminded of it all the time because I have a lot of ideas about how I think things are going to be or how they're going to sound. And and in the process of doing it, there comes a point where I have to slow down and just be like, all right, I need to listen to what's actually happening here. And you know that's a band effort. It's not just me doing that. Of course, you know it's Aaron and Travis, all of us working it out together. Um, uh, you know, but in the in the times where I'm by myself working on something and going, why isn't this work? Why isn't this work? Why isn't this work? And you know, grabbing a metronome and just slowing it way down, and then playing the same riffs to something that's a different timing altogether, and then it can jolt some new ideas. And so that song was kind of a an exercise in that, and also. Uh, the very tail end of that song that was a little more kind of unwritten particularly the vocal like how it was going to hit and also the high guitar melodies and when we put that together i remember just all of us just kind of sitting there going whoa this is we liked where it ended up nice <clears throat> how about <clears throat> excuse me how about nothing to win um I think that was kind of a similar thing, like that song, if anything, it was the other way around. That one started out slower mm. and then got faster. And um, where we started doing the speed picking and and just kind of feeling like, you know, at the time, I mean, for a while, I may not, I love like the 90s and two th early 2000s uh, Brazilian death metal. Oh, nice, yeah. And so like, you know, mental horror, and Ophiolatry, uh, Christian, of course, Rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of speed picking, that flurry of where it's just maximum power. And it's not necessarily, I mean, speaking for my own ability anyway, it's not necessarily finesse. <laughs> it's, it's the feeling of it. And uh, And I remember as uh, there's always one song on each record where where it's uh, it goes a direction that you don't necessarily anticipate. Mm -hmm. And the tail end section where it's like a lot of feedback and it's drum and bass underneath a lot of guitar feedback and vocal kind of kind of howling or whatever mm -hmm. that was kind of like the tickle of an idea um but when it came through in the studio it was like another instance where the song took on a new life and uh it felt we just love how kind of like punk it felt mm -hmm. and uh yeah it's a fun song it's really uh in in a set that song has made me, <clears throat> I've been taking vocal lessons. I haven't taken one for a while, but I took them for a good while there. And being able to stop, start, clean vocals with screaming and death roars mm -hmm. without damaging my clean voice. Mm -hmm. A song like that and playing it live over and over again really was this discipline of me learning how to technically work with my body to be able to 
change those things on a dime and do it for multiple tours, you know, without hurting myself. And yeah. so that song was a uh, pretty instrumental in learning how to do that. And also on the uh, side note too, on the Enslaved tour, uh, Grutla came out and sang that song with us a number of times. You know, I do the clean vocals, he do okay. the screams and yeah. holy moly. Give you a break was, on that. Yeah, nice. It was special, man. He was, first time he did, he's like, oh yeah, I'll try to do it. And then first time we tried it, he just, he just done his homework all night, you know, in, in the, uh, in the tour bus and then just did it. I'm a, I, I, I'm a singer as well. I'm more clean singing. Um, but I'm curious how you go back and forth between that. Like it was all from your, from your gut and try not to sing from your throat. Yeah. You know, di diaphragm for sure. Uh, placement, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you have the good support and then placing the voice where you want it. And um, that live, it's okay to like, take that moment where you ease into a note because there's so much going on you know on a record it would sound weird but live there are things that you can do that um where you ease into something and then you can open it up and part of that too is like making sure you're well stretched lots and lots of water staying hydrated like fucking peeing 12 times a day but that makes yeah. for a good vocal <laughs> performance yeah. you know it yeah. makes for a good good recovery mm -hmm. and um relaxed tongue relaxed face mm -hmm. you know a lot of you know classically technical tricks um also to singing like you said past uh trying to form the growls or the screams past the throat so the mm -hmm. air goes through and then you're forming it more up here instead of trying to form it in right. here I mean, there's a little bit of that that you can get sure. away with, but not, and then, not on a night to night basis though. <laughs> no. no. And really just not, not overdoing it, you know, cause mm -hmm. you can, you can overdo it and really go for something. And then your next five shows, you have to contend with the mistake that you made um, yeah. physically in a, either in an injury or a strain. And over time really it's it's kind of a bummer because i like to hang out and talk and but on a 40 date tour talking a lot yeah is not good for singing right um and so i've really had to manage how much i talk and warming up if i'm doing like even just doing interviews like mm -hmm. doing vocal warm-ups for interviews and things like that just to make sure that there's I mean, there's some things you can't control and you have to have humility about what you can or can't do in any sure. given moment. You, you do your best, you give your heart, you give everything you got. Um, but if I'm making mistakes that I can prevent at the end of a night where I didn't have a performance I like, that's, you know, that's more of a bummer, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. where I'm just like, where I can clearly trace the likely reason why I didn't sing well that night. And so I don't like that feeling. And not only that, people come a long way to come and see a show. And we want to be our best for ourselves, but we want to be our best for them. Mm -hmm. And so it's important. Yeah, cool. And you become a good listener, I bet, if you can't talk all the time, right? So that's also yeah. a good, that's a good thing. Yeah, let people talk. You know, I, <laughs> I, get, I get tired. I, you know, I don't want to talk about myself. You know, yeah. so, um, <laughs> like I like to hear what people have to say. Yeah, it's great um all right let's let's go back um how about uh unmasked the specter oh man that one went down pretty much like we'd planned it except mm -hmm. the uh the room that we recorded the basin mm -hmm. the iso booth for it also has this big huge reverb tank in it it's like an old metal reverb tank. It's giant. Hmm. And uh, and sometimes you it would make noises of its own, just reverberating with what was happening in the room. And so we did different things to kind of dampen it and you know, putting putting blankets over it and things like that. And 
Um, but in that song, there's a point there where we actually use that reverb tank mm. making the noise. And when uh, when Aaron's doing bass swells, where he's doing like this this volume pedal swell, and it makes all this big kind of like almost it almost sounds like a a giant ship like rubbing against a dock or something. Yeah, it's just like this big, mm-hmm. huge like kind of musical creaking sound, mm-hmm. and uh, and so we used it there. And hopefully, I'm not getting the the details of that incorrect. Um, if I am, sorry, Billy and Aaron and. Uh, <laughs> but it really made for this moment of like this thing that happened this once in a lifetime moment of nailing this idea with this sound and all the conditions coming together for this particular result uh that was a we we talked about that for a long time <laughs> mm, yeah. about how, how great that that went and turned out and uh So yeah, that's what I remember about that one. Great. And then the closer, Marrow, you mentioned a little bit about that song earlier, but let's talk about that one. That song was like, a being that I did a lot of touring, playing acoustic guitar, and also to just spend a lot of years playing acoustic. I worked in a guitar shop here in Eugene uh, called McKenzie River Music. Nice. And it, it was you know, arguably the best shop in Oregon um, for guitar to guitar to guitar on the wall. Um, Because we would have, you know, nice guitars that are, you know, kind of industry standard guitars, Fender Strats and Les Pauls and SGs and Telecasters and Martin guitars, Taylor guitars. Mm -hmm. But we also had... um, the owner, uh, Bob November, he was one of just a handful of Martin sanctioned appraisers for all of their old guitars. And that was due to his expertise with those guitars. So we would also have things like pre-World War II Martin D28s and mm. D18s and um, 12 fret guitars, you know, pre-1931, 12 fret guitars. We'd even have guitars from the 1800s come through. And he knew what all those things were and part of our job was you know if somebody had an old guitar and they called martin going where to kind of find out more about this if they were anywhere near us we were where they came and so i was able to watch that process and we also had that not the sanction appraising but he had a similar expertise with like old gretch pre-cbs fender um old gibson guitars every era of gibson and so that was the caliber of guitar that was walking through the door on a any calendar day of the year Um, and that also attracted that level of picker so we would have whoever was playing at the holt center you know whoever it may be whether it be neil young or jackson brown or uh, lyle lovett or um any of those league of players would come in and uh i remember one time uh, bruce coburn came in and i didn't know who he was i'd never met him and i was showing him a dan electro guitar and he just came in on this little fold-in bike and and, uh, he was playing and i remember being like oh well that's what you just did there was really cool he's like oh thanks and then he was i kept playing i was like wow that was really cool too And, and then he started doing stuff where i was just like like watching him and I just, I'm like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, um, so it was like that. And all of the people that worked in the shop were into country swing and they were all had thumb picks. And I was the metal kid. I was the guy who was going to talk to the, to the crowd that they didn't know how to talk to mm-hmm. and, you know, loud amps and, and shredding and, uh, which I don't shred at all, but I at least know how to, what it is and how to talk yeah, to, the, sure. to the, that clientele and about metal and whatever. So, but what they were doing, it was mostly like Travis picking, you know, things, you know, where it's like Merle Travis, Doc Watson, Chet Atkins. Mm-hmm. And it just was mind bending to me. And it wasn't long before I got a thumb pick. It was just banging my head against the wall. 
trying to learn how to play that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it. I, it helped me get to know those guitars better. It helped me be able to sell those guitars as well because I knew what it was and I could demonstrate what the guitars did accurately to somebody who was into a style of music where the guitar might serve them. And, uh, and it vastly changed the way I played guitar. Before I worked at the shop, I was mostly chucking out bar chords and, you know, mm -hmm. loved it. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started getting my right hand together to be, to be able to do Travis picking and then being able to also play with movable chords melodically, then I took everything that I already was into and opened up my world of playing. And I would say that was probably the first time that I actually began to have really my own style mm -hmm. um, that was kind of more my own. Um, but it came from country swing largely and being at that shop and Bob November and also a guy that worked there named uh, Dick Gunn who really I mean we probably I probably worked with him and Jeff who owned Dogwood's uh, recording uh, who recorded a lot of the early op stuff um, I spent probably the most time with them and sitting across from him while he was working out new ideas and he was a really great picker and great singer and uh wasn't the cleanest picker but he just attacked everything with just ferocity and gusto and and joy and uh and so i started that's what inspired me to do it and so leading into marrow a song like that is born of that kind of history um but also you know everything else too that that i already like and so um i think going into that that song i mean we we'd done some some big kind of epic kind of ballad ballady things in the past like uh um you know for sure you know the song the great cessation and uh um but something about marrow felt extra raw and exposed and it was one of those tunes where Well, we'll see how this is. We'll see how this is received. Um, but in the studio, we really, really felt it. And and in the process of layering vocals, I just come in. I the year prior was when, uh, or maybe a couple years prior, was when uh, Vol did our first record together. And you know john and cigarette are both classically trained and so when we are working on melodies and ideas for melodies there is no slop with them like you know it my by myself i would have maybe got it to some degree but their ears are so precise we just really hammered out ideas and how different kinds of vocals fit together and what what uh what different kinds of pitches are, are complementary that aren't just an octave higher um and so leading into layering the vocals for Mero in the chorus, I don't think I would have ever got it the way I did if it weren't for working with Vol and working with Sigurd and John. And they really helped me expand the way I layer vocals. And, and it definitely, there's a, a couple moments in it where we really, didn't anticipate how it was going to turn out mm -hmm. now when i say that that's you know I, I it's subjective i know that's not you know that's not going to be a, a favorite moment for for some fans you know particularly you know really people are in the crushing doom or whatever and that's i i get it you know but um for us that was definitely uh that was one of the more uncertain moments ever in the band's lifetime was to send that record out with that song on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had Essence on uh, The Unreal Never Lived, but initially that was a Japan only track. They, it wasn't going on the album proper. Uh, so people actually didn't really hear that song until quite a number of years later. And so it's like we, we did this really exposed, raw, kind of pretty heavy thing, but not a lot of people heard it, whereas right. Romero, Meryl, anyone that was poised to listen to this style of music or listen to Yob heard it. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And I think the response to that song was one of the big surprises yeah. of our life as a band. Um, and the fact that we thought, like, we thought that, you know, there's every song has, every record has some song on it that we're probably not going to play live for whatever reason. It just kind of works out that way. And the response to that song, we just kind of went, holy shit, we're going to have to learn how to play this mm -hmm. live mm -hmm. because we never performed it as a band all together. Like, We'd performed all the music beginning to end, but the vocal, that was the one of the, of the album where there was a lot of creation of that in the studio. Like, and it went smoothly, but then coming out of the studio, then we went back and learned how to play it live. And we went, wow, we're gonna have to play this every show. Yeah. No one's gonna let us not play this song. And so we did, we learned how to do it. It made us better, made me better, um, better than I'd ever been previously. That's great. On that topic, how do you guys come up with your set list when, you, when you've got such long songs? How do you guys decide which ones you wanna kind of attack at that show or you kind of like go from night to night or you have like a, I'm curious how you approach it. Well, our songs, uh, and I'll speak for myself anyway mm -hmm. here, um, our songs don't easily lend themselves to being able to just play something off the cuff. Mm. And be like, oh, we haven't played uh, In Our Blood in eight years. Let's give it a try live, you know, yeah. in front of yeah. 500 people, 800 <laughs> people, whatever. Uh. And just kind of have everybody walk away going, wow, we did really want to hear that song. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and so they would actually be more disappointed yeah if we just went for it then uh I, i'll never forget one time we played this show in uh, this festival it's so beautiful uh, such a beautiful comment um we play we were playing in i think it was portugal at amplifest mm. and we were playing this really very inspired set and we decided to veer off course because someone yelled, kept yelling, the great sensation, the great sensation. And we're like, we were kind of in the mode, kind of. And we decided to roll the dice. <laughs> and it was okay. Yeah. It wasn't straight up train wreck. You could tell we knew the song. <laughs> we were probably, we we're probably three rehearsals away from delivering a, a really good one. So it wasn't like totally horrible, but I was talking to this guy afterwards. He's like, he's like, your set was so beautiful. And this song and this song, I can't remember all the songs we played, but just, ah, uh. but then you've played the great cessation. And I'm wondering, why did you choose to do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh. And I'm, I'm just like, well, because somebody wanted us to, and so we did, but he's like, yeah, you know, it was, it was almost a perfect set. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lesson I'm learned a, in that comment, right? <laughs> and, and so to answer your question, I, th I think over time we've, we've gotten, we'll rehearse like a, a chunk of songs as potentials to play live and then we'll construct what we think is going to be our live set um and uh and we will then inter you know, we'll change out a couple songs here and there and it just really depends but what we find is sure there, there might be somebody who's really holding out for a particular song they're really hoping we're going to play it um even in a 90 minute set, that could be six songs. Yeah. For us, right. You know, and so, so it's, it's about creating a set that's interesting with peaks and valleys and not having it just be all fast or all mm -hmm. slow or, mm -hmm. you know, some good and a good section of a number of records. Um, and, uh, and then just really 
from town to town, just getting better and better and better and better with that set. And, and then we can just walk on stage and just know that like within that, sure, you know, things can happen. You can fuck up, you can trip, you can spill a beer on your amp, hopefully not, you know. Uh, actually, we've never done that, thank God. I've seen it happen. Knock on wood, right? Horrifying, <laughs> yeah. But like, there, there's shit, shit happens, you mm-hmm. know, and you can't, mm-hmm. you can't foresee the unforeseeable. But, uh, but I think, you know, being able to walk on stage and know that we're the best that we can be at that moment on that set and that the people that have come to see us are in good hands. That's, that is, we're, we're sure. And, you know, especially touring a number of times like Neurosis and seeing how they approach their sets and the discipline and, and how rigorous they are in the execution Mm -hmm. very 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 inspiring um people want that you know i want that Mm -hmm. you know i mean it's it's fun to see people people go for it or have a jam or whatever but yeah it can you know it it just depends you know it depends on the band too you know there are bands that can they can do that stuff you know i think for us for us just to pull a song off the cuff is not easy to do so we we try to curate a set we have a couple extra two or three songs that we can move in and out at any given time. Yeah. Often we get reasonable sound checks these days, depending on the situation when we're headlining our own tours. And so we can rehearse something in, in a sound check or, or whatever and get it to a good place and then make a decision in the moment. But um, I think we err towards providing the most consistently uh, rehearsed set that we can and then we just vibe off a crowd and, and they vibe off of us. And then we just start building all the energy up together. And every night is brand new. Even if we play the same set 20 times in a row, every night is different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I was just curious about that. So thank you for, for giving me the thought process there. Um, I, I hope you had a couple of more minutes. I had one more question I wanted to, to ask you if that's all right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since this is a uh, part of the vinyl club, I wanted to, I usually ask about the album artwork since we'll all be holding the record in our hands. So can you tell us a little bit about the album artwork and how that came to be and uh, maybe the artists that worked on it? Well, Orion Landau uh, did the artwork and he's been one of Relapse Records main, if not the main art and layout uh, people since early nineties. So he's been doing album art for a long time. And when we, because, you know, it's really important here to mention too, that, you know, this was a collaboration, like we were on Neurot Records, mm-hmm. right? So this was, for us, it was the, the, the feeling of, of Neurosis choosing us to be on their record label. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the, a high point in my life I would have never I never saw coming Mm -hmm. and um and relapse was doing the vinyl and so Orion and relapse offered to do layouts for the record and uh and Steve and their history with relapse too everything it was it was uh, it felt pretty charmed it was pretty cool and and of course we gave Orion like maybe the vaguest direction ever which is like we don't want there to be a focal point of a person or eyes Mm -hmm. we don't want there to be overt symbology we want it to feel heavy and spiritual in a sense, like mystic, a uh, kind of an mm-hmm. air, a vibe, without overtly co-opting other things to get there. And so he threw out a few ideas, and and it was on the process. And we're like, and a couple of them were, <coughs> it was all heading in the direction. I mean, he started off in in the right idea. Um, he's really an intuitive uh, artist. And we had a couple of things where it was like, that's almost there, but, and so he said one time, I'm not doing a very good job of recounting this because so much of it was just 
in the moment going back and forth. But he put forward and he said, all right, well, let's take all these other things out and let's just start here. And the thing that he sent us, we're like, that's it. <laughs> like that, that is it. You, you've you arrived, that is already, that is it. And so the, the thing is like, okay, let's start now with this. And just after a few ideas went back and forth and that was the album cover. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and it was this, eerie moment of like going because we were just reading the email going okay well let's start here and then the jpeg downloads and we're just like oh. i'm sure talk. he felt as good as you did when you said that too oh, yeah. <laughs> it was, and we've done a number of album covers with him since and uh he's uh it's just real joy to work with him cool um i i wouldn't I wanted to end with to hear what you guys are up to now. What's what's new with Yob and and what's next? Well, we uh, we did a um, on a Glory or Death Records. We did a, a Deep Purple song mm. on a uh, compilation. Nice. And we did Perfect Strangers. Perfect. Nice. Yeah. And uh, it's the first time in our history that we've done a cover. Mm -hmm. uh, we've messed with covers and rehearsal space here and there, like ah, so you can destroy and you know whatever, but. Um, uh, you know, for whom the bell tolls, but in drop A and mm -hmm. half speed, and and <laughs> it's fun. You know, we don't really know those songs, but this is the first time we went out of our way to learn a cover and record it, and it was a a blast. It was really fun to do. Um, I love that record, and yeah, so it was it was super fun. Um, it's a lot of organ or keyboards in that song too, though, right? Yeah, yeah, and we didn't we didn't do that. I mean, our version was like i think the original version it's in pitch but in d mm -hmm. and uh i think the the tempo on it is like a like we clocked it at like 97 or 98 or something like that and so we we did ours at around 82 mm -hmm. but then we half timed 82 and so but we stayed really true to the song other than that and we didn't put keyboard in, but just the heavy distorted guitar in A. Mm -hmm. I think it, you know, we don't have a keyboard player anyway. But, uh, um, yeah. but I mean, we, we tried it. We tried messing around. We could have done it, but we just liked how heavy and raw it sounded the way it was and kept the vocal really true to the original performance for the most part. I did a couple, I got jiggy with it a couple times, I guess. But, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh but at any rate, uh, and then we're working on new music and the idea is new music. And we have some tentative stuff that we're looking at for 2022 for tour. Great. And uh, um, being that like every other band, we, we at the beginning of uh, 2020, we'd scheduled, canceled, rescheduled, canceled, yeah. rescheduled, canceled you know yeah. by like july and then we're like okay well i guess we'll see what 2021 looks like and well it's 2022 but yeah. um but that feels good it feels like a good time and um really excited to do it and and uh but really the focus right now is we're writing great 